There once was a man who lived in Ramathaim. He was descended from the old Zuf family in the Ephraim hills. His name was Elkanah. He was connected with the Zufs from Ephraim through his father Jerahem, his grandfather Elihu, and his great-grandfather Tohu. He had two wives. The first was Hannah, the second was Peninnah. Peninnah had children, Hannah did not. Every year this man went from his hometown up to Shiloh to worship and offer a sacrifice to God of the angel armies. Eli and his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, served as the priests of God there. When Elkanah sacrificed, he passed helpings from the sacrificial meal around to his wife Peninnah and all her children, but he always gave an especially generous helping to Hannah because he loved her so much, and because God had not given her children. But her rival wife taunted her cruelly, rubbing it in and never letting her forget that God had not given her children. This went on year after year. Every time she went to the sanctuary of God she could expect to be taunted. Hannah was reduced to tears and had no appetite. Her husband Elkanah said, Oh, Hannah, why are you crying? Why aren't you eating? And why are you so upset? Am I not of more worth to you than ten sons? So Hannah ate. Then she pulled herself together, slipped away quietly, and entered the sanctuary. The priest Eli was on duty at the entrance to God's temple in the customary seat. Crushed in soul, Hannah prayed to God and cried and cried, inconsolably. Then she made a vow. Oh, God of the angel armies! If you'll take a good, hard look at my pain. If you'll quit neglecting me and go into action for me. By giving me a son. I'll give him completely, unreservedly to you. I'll set him apart for a life of holy discipline. It so happened that as she continued in prayer before God, Eli was watching her closely. Hannah was praying in her heart, silently. Her lips moved, but no sound was heard. Eli jumped to the conclusion that she was drunk. He approached her and said, You're drunk. How long do you plan to keep this up? Sober up, woman. Hannah said, Oh no, sir, please. I'm a woman broken hearted. I haven't been drinking. Not a drop of wine or beer. The only thing I've been pouring out is my heart, pouring it out to God. Don't for a minute think I'm a bad woman. It's because I'm so desperately unhappy and in such pain that I've stayed here so long. Eli answered her, Go in peace. And may the God of Israel give you what you have asked of him. Think well of me, and pray for me, she said, and went her way. Then she ate heartily, her face radiant. Up before dawn, they worshipped God and returned home to Ramah. Elkanah slept with Hannah his wife, and God began making the necessary arrangements in response to what she had asked. Before the year was out, Hannah had conceived and given birth to a son. She named him Samuel, explaining, I asked God for him. When Elkanah next took his family on their annual trip to Shiloh to worship God, offering sacrifices and keeping his vow, Hannah didn't go. She told her husband, after the child is weaned, I'll bring him myself and present him before God, and that's where he'll stay, for good. Elkanah said to his wife, Do what you think is best. Stay home until you have weaned him. Yes. Let God complete what he has begun. So she did. She stayed home and nursed her son until she had weaned him. Then she took him up to Shiloh, bringing also the makings of a generous sacrificial meal, a prize bull, flour, and wine. 
The child was so young to be sent off. They first butchered the bull, then brought the child to Eli. Hannah said, Excuse me, sir. Would you believe that I'm the very woman who was standing before you at this very spot, praying to God? I prayed for this child, and God gave me what I asked for. And now I have dedicated him to God. He's dedicated to God for life. Then and there, they worshipped God. Hannah prayed, I'm bursting with God news. I'm walking on air. I'm laughing at my rivals. I'm dancing my salvation. Nothing and no one is holy like God. No rock mountain like our God. Don't dare talk pretentiously. Not a word of boasting, ever. For God knows what's going on. He takes the measure of everything that happens. The weapons of the strong are smashed to pieces. While the weak are infused with fresh strength. The well-fed are out begging in the streets for crusts. While the hungry are getting second helpings. The barren woman has a house full of children. While the mother of many is bereft. God brings death and God brings life. Brings down to the grave and raises up. God brings poverty and God brings wealth. He lowers, he also lifts up. He puts poor people on their feet again. He rekindles burned out lives with fresh hope. Restoring dignity and respect to their lives. A place in the sun. For the very structures of earth are God's. He has laid out his operations on a firm foundation. He protectively cares for his faithful friends, step by step. But leaves the wicked to stumble in the dark. No one makes it in this life by sheer muscle. God's enemies will be blasted out of the sky. Crashed in a heap and burned. God will set things right all over the earth. He'll give strength to his king. He'll set his anointed on top of the world. Elkanah went home to Ramah. The boy stayed and served God in the company of Eli the priest. Eli's own sons were nothing but trouble. They didn't know God and could not have cared less about the customs of priests among the people. Ordinarily, when someone offered a sacrifice, the priest's servant was supposed to come up and, while the meat was boiling, stab a three-pronged fork into the cooking pot. The priest then got whatever came up on the fork. But this is how Eli's sons treated all the Israelites who came to Shiloh to offer sacrifices to God. Before they had even burned the fat to God, the priest's servant would interrupt whoever was sacrificing and say, hand over some of that meat for the priest to roast. He doesn't like boiled meat, he likes his rare. If the man objected, first let the fat be burned, God's portion, then take all you want, the servant would demand, no, I want it now. If you won't give it, I'll take it. It was a horrible sin these young servants were committing, and right in the presence of God, desecrating the holy offerings to God. In the midst of all this, Samuel, a boy dressed in a priestly linen tunic, served God. Additionally, every year his mother would make him a little robe cut to his size and bring it to him when she and her husband came for the annual sacrifice. Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife, saying, God give you children to replace this child you have dedicated to God. Then they would go home. God was most especially kind to Hannah. She had three more sons and two daughters. The boy Samuel stayed at the sanctuary and grew up with God. By this time Eli was very old. He kept getting reports on how his sons were ripping off the people and sleeping with the women who helped out at the sanctuary. Eli called them out, 
what's going on here? Why are you doing these things? I hear story after story of your corrupt and evil carrying on. Oh, my sons, this is not right. These are terrible reports I'm getting, stories spreading right and left among God's people. If you sin against another person, there's help, God's help. But if you sin against God, who is around to help? But they were far gone in disobedience and refused to listen to a thing their father said. So God, who was fed up with them, decreed their death. But the boy Samuel was very much alive, growing up, blessed by God and popular with the people. A holy man came to Eli and said, This is God's message, I revealed myself openly to your ancestors when they were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt. Out of all the tribes of Israel, I chose your family to be my priests, to preside at the altar, to burn incense, to wear the priestly robes in my presence. I put your ancestral family in charge of all the sacrificial offerings of Israel. So why do you now treat as mere loot these very sacrificial offerings that I commanded for my worship? Why do you treat your sons better than me? turning them loose to get fat on these offerings, and ignoring me. Therefore, this is God's word, the God of Israel speaking, I once said that you and your ancestral family would be my priests indefinitely, but now, God's word, remember, there is no way this can continue. I honor those who honor me. Those who scorn me I demean. Be well warned. It won't be long before I wipe out both your family and your future family. No one in your family will make it to old age. You'll see good things that I'm doing in Israel, but you'll see it and weep, for no one in your family will live to enjoy it. I will leave one person to serve at my altar, but it will be a hard life, with many tears. Everyone else in your family will die before their time. What happens to your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, will be the proof, both will die the same day. Then I'll establish for myself a true priest. He'll do what I want him to do, be what I want him to be. I'll make his position secure and he'll do his work freely in the service of my anointed one. Survivors from your family will come to him begging for handouts, saying, please, Give me some priest work, just enough to put some food on the table. The boy Samuel was serving God under Eli's direction. This was at a time when the revelation of God was rarely heard or seen. One night Eli was sound asleep, his eyesight was very bad, he could hardly see. It was well before dawn, the sanctuary lamp was still burning. Samuel was still in bed in the temple of God, where the chest of God rested. Then God called out, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel answered, Yes. I'm here. Then he ran to Eli saying, I heard you call. Here I am. Eli said, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. And so he did. God called again, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli, I heard you call. Here I am. Again Eli said, Son, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. This all happened before Samuel knew God for himself. It was before the revelation of God had been given to him personally. God called again, Samuel. The third time. Yet again Samuel got up and went to Eli, Yes. I heard you call me. Here I am. That's when it dawned on Eli that God was calling the boy. So Eli directed Samuel, Go back and lie down. If the voice calls again, Say, Speak, God. I'm your servant, ready to listen. Samuel returned to his bed. 
Then God came and stood before him exactly as before, calling out, Samuel. Samuel. Samuel answered, Speak. I'm your servant, ready to listen. God said to Samuel, Listen carefully. I'm getting ready to do something in Israel that is going to shake everyone up and get their attention. The time has come for me to bring down on Eli's family everything I warned him of, every last word of it. I'm letting him know that the time's up. I'm bringing judgment on his family for good. He knew what was going on, that his sons were desecrating God's name and God's place, and he did nothing to stop them. This is my sentence on the family of Eli, the evil of Eli's family can never be wiped out by sacrifice or offering. Samuel stayed in bed until morning, then rose early and went about his duties, opening the doors of the sanctuary, but he dreaded having to tell the vision to Eli. But then Eli summoned Samuel, Samuel, my son. Samuel came running, yes. What can I do for you? What did he say? Tell it to me, all of it. Don't suppress or soften one word, as God is your judge. I want it all, word for word as he said it to you. So Samuel told him, word for word. He held back nothing. Eli said, He is God. Let him do whatever he thinks best. Samuel grew up. God was with him, and Samuel's prophetic record was flawless. Everyone in Israel, from Dan in the north to Beersheba in the south, recognized that Samuel was the real thing, a true prophet of God. God continued to show up at Shiloh, revealed through his word to Samuel at Shiloh. Whatever Samuel said was broadcast all through Israel. Israel went to war against the Philistines. Israel set up camp at Ebenezer, the Philistines at Aphek. The Philistines marched out to meet Israel, the fighting spread, and Israel was badly beaten, about 4,000 soldiers left dead on the field. When the troops returned to camp, Israel's elders said, Why has God given us such a beating today by the Philistines? Let's go to Shiloh and get the chest of God's covenant. It will accompany us and save us from the grip of our enemies. So the army sent orders to Shiloh. They brought the chest of the covenant of God, the God of the angel armies, the cherubim enthroned God. Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, accompanied the chest of the covenant of God. When the chest of the covenant of God was brought into camp, everyone gave a huge cheer. The shouts were like thunderclaps shaking the very ground. The Philistines heard the shouting and wondered what on earth was going on, what's all this shouting among the Hebrews? Then they learned that the chest of God had entered the Hebrew camp. The Philistines panicked, their gods have come to their camp. Nothing like this has ever happened before. We're done for. Who can save us from the clutches of these super gods? These are the same gods who hit the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues out in the wilderness. On your feet, Philistines. Courage. We're about to become slaves to the Hebrews, just as they have been slaves to us. Show what you're made of. Fight for your lives. And did they ever fight? It turned into a rout. They thrashed Israel so mercilessly that the Israelite soldiers ran for their lives, leaving behind an incredible 30,000 dead. As if that wasn't bad enough, the chest of God was taken and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were killed. Immediately, a Benjaminite raced from the front lines back to Shiloh. Shirt torn and face smeared with dirt, he entered the town. Eli was sitting on his stool beside the road keeping vigil, 
for he was extremely worried about the chest of God. When the man ran straight into town to tell the bad news, everyone wept. They were appalled. Eli heard the loud wailing and asked, Why this uproar? The messenger hurried over and reported. Eli was ninety-eight years old then, and blind. The man said to Eli, I've just come from the front, barely escaping with my life. And so, my son, said Eli, what happened? The messenger answered, Israel scattered before the Philistines. The defeat was catastrophic, with enormous losses. Your sons Hophni and Phinehas died, and the chest of God was taken. At the words, chest of God, Eli fell backward off his stool where he sat next to the gate. Eli was an old man, and very fat. When he fell, he broke his neck and died. He had led Israel forty years. His daughter-in-law, the wife of Phinehas, was pregnant and ready to deliver. When she heard that the chest of God had been taken and that both her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she dropped to her knees to give birth, going into hard labor. As she was about to die, her midwife said, Don't be afraid. You've given birth to a son. But she gave no sign that she had heard. The chest of God gone, father-in-law dead, husband dead, she named the boy Ichabod, glory's gone, saying, Glory is exiled from Israel since the chest of God was taken. Once the Philistines had seized the chest of God, they took it from Ebenezer to Ashdod, brought it into the shrine of Dagon, and placed it alongside the idol of Dagon. Next morning when the citizens of Ashdod got up, they were shocked to find Dagon toppled from his place, flat on his face before the chest of God. They picked him up and put him back where he belonged. First thing the next morning they found him again, toppled and flat on his face before the chest of God. Dagon's head and arms were broken off, strewn across the entrance. Only his torso was in one piece. That's why even today, the priests of Dagon and visitors to the Dagon shrine in Ashdod avoid stepping on the threshold. God was hard on the citizens of Ashdod. He devastated them by hitting them with tumors. This happened in both the town and the surrounding neighborhoods. He let loose rats among them. Jumping from ships there, rats swarmed all over the city. And everyone was deathly afraid. When the leaders of Ashdod saw what was going on, they decided, the chest of the God of Israel has got to go. We can't handle this, and neither can our God Dagon. They called together all the Philistine leaders and put it to them, How can we get rid of the chest of the God of Israel? The leaders agreed, Move it to Gath. So they moved the chest of the God of Israel to Gath. But as soon as they moved it there, God came down hard on that city, too. It was mass hysteria. He hit them with tumors. Tumors broke out on everyone in town, young and old. So they sent the chest of God on to Ekron, but as the chest was being brought into town, the people shouted in protest, You'll kill us all by bringing in this chest of the God of Israel. They called the Philistine leaders together and demanded, Get it out of here, this chest of the God of Israel. Send it back where it came from. We're threatened with mass death. For everyone was scared to death when the chest of God showed up. God was already coming down very hard on the place. Those who didn't die were hit with tumors. All over the city cries of pain and lament filled the air. After the chest of God had been among the Philistine people for seven months, the Philistine leaders called together their religious professionals, the priests, and experts on the supernatural for consultation, how can we get rid of this chest of God, get it off our hands without making things worse. 
Tell us. They said, If you're going to send the chest of the God of Israel back, don't just dump it on them. Pay compensation. Then you will be healed. After you're in the clear again, God will let up on you. Why wouldn't he? And what exactly would make for adequate compensation? Five gold tumors and five gold rats, they said, to match the number of Philistine leaders. Since all of you, leaders and people, suffered the same plague, make replicas of the tumors and rats that are devastating the country and present them as an offering to the glory of the God of Israel. Then maybe he'll ease up and not be so hard on you and your gods, and on your country. Why be stubborn like the Egyptians and Pharaoh? God didn't quit pounding on them until they let the people go. Only then did he let up. So here's what you do, take a brand new ox cart and two cows that have never been in harness. Hitch the cows to the ox cart and send their calves back to the barn. Put the chest of God on the cart. Secure the gold replicas of the tumors and rats that you are offering as compensation in a sack and set them next to the chest. Then send it off. But keep your eyes on it. If it heads straight back home to where it came from, toward Beth Shemesh, it is clear that this catastrophe is a divine judgment, but if not, we'll know that God had nothing to do with it, it was just an accident. So that's what they did, they hitched two cows to the cart, put their calves in the barn, and placed the chest of God and the sack of gold rats and tumors on the cart. The cows headed straight for home, down the road to Beth Shemesh, straying neither right nor left, mooing all the way. The Philistine leaders followed them to the outskirts of Beth Shemesh. The people of Beth Shemesh were harvesting wheat in the valley. They looked up and saw the chest. Elated, they ran to meet it. The cart came into the field of Joshua, a Beth Shemeshite, and stopped there beside a huge boulder. The harvesters tore the cart to pieces, then chopped up the wood and sacrificed the cows as a burnt offering to God. The Levites took charge of the chest of God and the sack containing the gold offerings, placing them on the boulder. Offering the sacrifices, everyone in Beth Shemesh worshipped God most heartily that day. When the five Philistine leaders saw what they came to see, they returned the same day to Ekron. The five gold replicas of the tumors were offered by the Philistines in compensation for the cities of Ashdod, Gaza, Ashkelon, Gath, and Ekron. The five gold rats matched the number of Philistine towns, both large and small, ruled by the five leaders. The big boulder on which they placed the chest of God is still there in the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh, a landmark. God struck some of the men of Beth Shemesh who, out of curiosity, irreverently peeked into the chest of God. Seventy died. The whole town was in mourning, reeling under the hard blow from God, and questioning, who can stand before God, this holy God? And who can we get to take this chest off our hands? They sent emissaries to Kiriath Jerim, saying, The Philistines have returned the chest of God. Come down and get it. And they did. The men of Kiriath Jerim came and got the chest of God and delivered it to the house of Abinadab on the hill. They ordained his son, Eliezer to take responsibility for the chest of God. From the time that the chest came to rest in Kiriath Jerim, a long time passed, twenty years it was, and throughout Israel there was a widespread, fearful movement toward God. Then Samuel addressed the house of Israel, If you are truly serious about coming back to God, clean house. Get rid of the foreign gods and fertility goddesses, Ground yourselves firmly in God, worship Him and Him alone, and He'll save you from Philistine oppression. They did it. 
They got rid of the gods and goddesses, the images of Baal and Ashtoreth, and gave their exclusive attention and service to God. Next Samuel said, Get everybody together at Mizpah and I'll pray for you. So everyone assembled at Mizpah. They drew water from the wells and poured it out before God in a ritual of cleansing. They fasted all day and prayed, We have sinned against God. So Samuel prepared the Israelites for holy war there at Mizpah. When the Philistines heard that Israel was meeting at Mizpah, the Philistine leaders went on the offensive. Israel got the report and became frightened, Philistines on the move again. They pleaded with Samuel, pray with all your might. And don't let up. Pray to God, our God, that he'll save us from the boot of the Philistines. Samuel took a young lamb not yet weaned and offered it whole as a whole burnt offering to God. He prayed fervently to God, interceding for Israel. And God answered. While Samuel was offering the sacrifice, the Philistines came within range to fight Israel. Just then God thundered, a huge thunderclap exploding among the Philistines. They panicked, mass confusion, and scattered before Israel. Israel poured out of Mizpah and gave chase, killing Philistines right and left, to a point just beyond beth -car. Samuel took a single rock and set it upright between Mizpah and Shen. He named it Ebenezer, Rock of Help, saying, This marks the place where God helped us. The Philistines learned their lesson and stayed home, no more border crossings. God was hard on the Philistines all through Samuel's lifetime. All the cities from Ekron to Gath that the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored. Israel also freed the surrounding countryside from Philistine control. And there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. Samuel gave solid leadership to Israel his entire life. Every year he went on a circuit from Bethel to Gilgal to Mizpah. He gave leadership to Israel in each of these places. But always he would return to Ramah, where he lived, and preside from there. That is where he built an altar to God. When Samuel got to be an old man, he set his sons up as judges in Israel. His firstborn son was named Joel, the name of his second, Abijah. They were assigned duty in Beersheba. But his sons didn't take after him, they were out for what they could get for themselves, taking bribes, corrupting justice. Fed up, all the elders of Israel got together and confronted Samuel at Ramah. They presented their case, look, you're an old man, and your sons aren't following in your footsteps. Here's what we want you to do, appoint a king to rule us, just like everybody else. When Samuel heard their demand, give us a king to rule us. He was crushed. How awful! Samuel prayed to God. God answered Samuel, go ahead and do what they're asking. They are not rejecting you. They've rejected me as their king. From the day I brought them out of Egypt until this very day they've been behaving like this, leaving me for other gods. And now they're doing it to you. So let them have their own way. But warn them of what they're in for. Tell them the way kings operate, just what they're likely to get from a king. So Samuel told them, delivered God's warning to the people who were asking him to give them a king. He said, this is the way the kind of king you're talking about operates. He'll take your sons and make soldiers of them, chariotry, cavalry, infantry, regimented in battalions and squadrons. He'll put some to forced labor on his farms, plowing and harvesting, and others to making either weapons of war or chariots in which he can ride in luxury. He'll put your daughters to work as beauticians and waitresses and cooks. 
he'll conscript your best fields, vineyards, and orchards and hand them over to his special friends. He'll tax your harvests and vintage to support his extensive bureaucracy. Your prize workers and best animals he'll take for his own use. He'll lay a tax on your flocks and you'll end up no better than slaves. The day will come when you will cry in desperation because of this king you so much want for yourselves. But don't expect God to answer. But the people wouldn't listen to Samuel. No, they said. We will have a king to rule us. Then we'll be just like all the other nations. Our king will rule us and lead us and fight our battles. Samuel took in what they said and rehearsed it with God. God told Samuel, do what they say. Make them a king. Then Samuel dismissed the men of Israel, go home, each of you to your own city. There was a man from the tribe of Benjamin named Kish. He was the son of Abel, grandson of Zerur, great-grandson of Becherath, great-great-grandson of Aphiah, a Benjaminite of stalwart character. He had a son, Saul, a most handsome young man. There was none finer, he literally stood head and shoulders above the crowd. Some of Kish's donkeys got lost. Kish said to his son, Saul, take one of the servants with you and go look for the donkeys. Saul took one of the servants and went to find the donkeys. They went into the hill country of Ephraim around Shalisha, but didn't find them. Then they went over to Shalim, no luck. Then to Jabin, and still nothing. When they got to Zuth, Saul said to the young man with him, Enough of this. Let's go back. Soon my father is going to forget about the donkeys and start worrying about us. He replied, not so fast. There's a holy man in this town. He carries a lot of weight around here. What he says is always right on the mark. Maybe he can tell us where to go. Saul said, if we go, what do we have to give him? There's no more bread in our sacks. We've nothing to bring as a gift to the holy man. Do we have anything else? The servant spoke up, Look, I just happen to have this silver coin. I'll give it to the holy man and he'll tell us how to proceed. In former times in Israel, a person who wanted to seek God's word on a matter would say, Let's visit the seer, because the one we now call, the prophet, used to be called, the seer. Good, said Saul, let's go. And they set off for the town where the holy man lived. As they were climbing up the hill into the town, they met some girls who were coming out to draw water. They said to them, Is this where the seer lives? They answered, It sure is, just ahead. Hurry up. He's come today because the people have prepared a sacrifice at the shrine. As soon as you enter the town, you can catch him before he goes up to the shrine to eat. The people won't eat until he arrives, for he has to bless the sacrifice. Only then can everyone eat. So get going. You're sure to find him. They continued their climb and entered the city. And then there he was, Samuel, coming straight toward them on his way to the shrine. The very day before, God had confided in Samuel, This time tomorrow, I'm sending a man from the land of Benjamin to meet you. You're to anoint him as prince over my people Israel. He will free my people from Philistine oppression. Yes, I know all about their hard circumstances. I've heard their cries for help. The moment Samuel laid eyes on Saul, God said, He's the one, the man I told you about. This is the one who will keep my people in check. Saul came up to Samuel in the street and said, Pardon me, but can you tell me where the seer lives? 
I'm the seer, said Samuel. Accompany me to the shrine and eat with me. In the morning I'll tell you all about what's on your mind, and send you on your way. And by the way, your lost donkeys, the ones you've been hunting for the last three days, have been found, so don't worry about them. At this moment, Israel's future is in your hands. Saul answered, But I'm only a Benjaminite, from the smallest of Israel's tribes, and from the most insignificant clan in the tribe at that. Why are you talking to me like this? Samuel took Saul and his servant and led them into the dining hall at the shrine and seated them at the head of the table. There were about thirty guests. Then Samuel directed the chef, Bring the choice cut I pointed out to you, the one I told you to reserve. The chef brought it and placed it before Saul with a flourish, saying, This meal was kept aside just for you. Eat. It was especially prepared for this time and occasion with these guests. Saul ate with Samuel, a memorable day. Afterward they went down from the shrine into the city. A bed was prepared for Saul on the breeze-cooled roof of Samuel's house. They woke at the break of day. Samuel called to Saul on the roof, Get up and I'll send you off. Saul got up and the two of them went out in the street. As they approached the outskirts of town, Samuel said to Saul, Tell your servant to go on ahead of us. You stay with me for a bit. I have a word of God to give you. Then Samuel took a flask of oil, poured it on Saul's head, and kissed him. He said, Do you see what this means? God has anointed you prince over his people. This sign will confirm God's anointing of you as prince over his inheritance, after you leave me today, as you get closer to your home country of Benjamin, you'll meet two men near Rachel's tomb. They'll say, the donkeys you went to look for are found. Your father has forgotten about the donkeys and is worried about you, wringing his hands, quite beside himself. Leaving there, you'll arrive at the Oak of Tabor. There you'll meet three men going up to worship God at Bethel. One will be carrying three young goats, another carrying three sacks of bread, and the third a jug of wine. They'll say, Hello, how are you, and offer you two loaves of bread, which you will accept. Next, you'll come to Gibeah of God, where there's a Philistine garrison. As you approach the town, you'll run into a bunch of prophets coming down from the shrine, playing harps and tambourines, flutes and drums. And they'll be prophesying. Before you know it, the Spirit of God will come on you and you'll be prophesying right along with them. And you'll be transformed. You'll be a new person. When these confirming signs are accomplished, you'll know that you're ready, whatever job you're given to do, do it. God is with you. Now, go down to Gilgal and I will follow. I'll come down and join you in worship by sacrificing burnt offerings and peace offerings. Wait seven days. Then I'll come and tell you what to do next. Saul turned and left Samuel. At that very moment God transformed him, made him a new person. And all the confirming signs took place the same day. When Saul and his party got to Gibeah, there were the prophets, right in front of them. Before he knew it, the Spirit of God came on Saul and he was prophesying right along with them. When those who had previously known Saul saw him prophesying with the prophets, they were totally surprised. What's going on here? What's come over the son of Kish? How on earth did Saul get to be a prophet? One man spoke up and said, Who started this? Where did these people ever come from? That's how the saying got started, Saul among the prophets. Who would have guessed? 
When Saul was done prophesying, he returned home. His uncle asked him and his servant, So where have you two been all this time? Out looking for the donkeys. We looked and looked and couldn't find them. And then we found Samuel. So, said Saul's uncle, what did Samuel tell you? Saul said, he told us not to worry, the donkeys had been found. But Saul didn't breathe a word to his uncle of what Samuel said about the king business. Samuel called the people to assemble before God at Mizpah. He addressed the children of Israel, This is God's personal message to you. I brought Israel up out of Egypt. I delivered you from Egyptian oppression, yes, from all the bullying governments that made your life miserable. And now you want nothing to do with your God, the very God who has a history of getting you out of troubles of all sorts. And now you say, no. We want a king, give us a king. Well, if that's what you want, that's what you'll get. Present yourselves formally before God, ranked in tribes and families. After Samuel got all the tribes of Israel lined up, the Benjamin tribe was picked. Then he lined up the Benjamin tribe in family groups, and the family of Matri was picked. The family of Matri took its place in the lineup, and the name Saul, son of Kish, was picked. But when they went looking for him, he was nowhere to be found. Samuel went back to God, is he anywhere around? God said, yes, he's right over there, hidden in that pile of baggage. They ran and got him. He took his place before everyone, standing tall, head and shoulders above them. Samuel then addressed the people, take a good look at whom God has chosen, the best. No one like him in the whole country. Then a great shout went up from the people, Long live the king. Samuel went on to instruct the people in the rules and regulations involved in a kingdom, wrote it all down in a book, and placed it before God. Then Samuel sent everyone home. Saul also went home to Gibeah, and with him some true and brave men whom God moved to join him. But the riffraff went off muttering, Deliverer! Don't make me laugh! They held him in contempt and refused to congratulate him. But Saul paid them no mind. Naash, king of the Ammonites, was brutalizing the tribes of Gad and Reuben, gouging out their right eyes and intimidating anyone who would come to Israel's help. There were very few Israelites living on the east side of the Jordan River who had not had their right eyes gouged out by Naash. But 7,000 men had escaped from the Ammonites and were now living safely in Jabesh. So Naash went after them and prepared to go to war against Jabesh Gilead. The men of Jabesh petitioned Naash, Make a treaty with us and we'll serve you. Naash said, I'll make a treaty with you on one condition, that every right eye among you be gouged out. I'll humiliate every last man and woman in Israel before I'm done. The town leaders of Jabesh said, Give us time to send messengers around Israel, seven days should do it. If no one shows up to help us, we'll accept your terms. The messengers came to Saul's place at Gibeah and told the people what was going on. As the people broke out in loud wails, Saul showed up. He was coming back from the field with his oxen. Saul asked, What happened? Why is everyone crying? And they repeated the message that had come from Jabesh. The Spirit of God came on Saul when he heard the report and he flew into a rage. He grabbed the yoke of oxen and butchered them on the spot. He sent the messengers throughout Israel distributing the bloody pieces with this message, Anyone who refuses to join up with Saul and Samuel, let this be the fate of his oxen. The terror of God seized the people, 
and they came out, one and all, not a laggard among them. Saul took command of the people at Bezek. There were three hundred thousand men from Israel, another thirty thousand from Judah. Saul instructed the messengers, Tell this to the folk in Jabesh Gilead, Help is on the way. Expect it by noon tomorrow. The messengers set straight off and delivered their message. Elated, the people of Jabesh Gilead sent word to Naash, Tomorrow we'll give ourselves up. You can deal with us on your terms. Long before dawn the next day, Saul had strategically placed his army in three groups. At first light they broke into the enemy camp and slaughtered Ammonites until noon. Those who were left ran for their lives, scattering every which way. The people came to Samuel then and said, Where are those men who said, Saul is not fit to rule over us? Hand them over. We'll kill them. But Saul said, Nobody is going to be executed this day. This is the day God saved Israel. Come, let's go to Gilgal and there reconsecrate the kingship. They all trooped out to Gilgal. Before God, they crowned Saul king at Gilgal. And there they worshipped, sacrificing peace offerings. Saul and all Israel celebrated magnificently. Samuel addressed all Israel, I've listened to everything you've said to me, listen carefully to every word, and I've given you a king. See for yourself, your king among you, leading you. But now look at me, I'm old and gray, and my sons are still here. I've led you faithfully from my youth until this very day. Look at me. Do you have any complaints to bring before God and His anointed? Have I ever stolen so much as an ox or a donkey? Have I ever taken advantage of you or exploited you? Have I ever taken a bribe or played fast and loose with the law? Bring your complaint and I'll make it right. Oh no, they said, never. You've never done any of that, never abused us, never lined your own pockets. That settles it then, said Samuel. God is witness, and his anointed is witness that you find nothing against me, no faults, no complaints. And the people said, He is witness. Samuel continued, This is the God who made Moses and Aaron your leaders and brought your ancestors out of Egypt. Take your stand before him now as I review your case before God in the light of all the righteous ways in which God has worked with you and your ancestors. When Jacob's sons entered Egypt, the Egyptians made life hard for them and they cried for help to God. God sent Moses and Aaron, who led your ancestors out of Egypt and settled them here in this place. They soon forgot their God, so he sold them off to Sisera, commander of Hazer's army, later to a hard life under the Philistines, and still later to the king of Moab. They had to fight for their lives. Then they cried for help to God. They confessed, We've sinned. We've gone off and left God and worshipped the fertility gods and goddesses of Canaan. Oh, deliver us from the brutalities of our enemies and we'll worship you alone. So God sent Jeroboam, Gideon, Bidan, Barak, Jephthah, and Samuel. He saved you from that hard life surrounded by enemies, and you lived in peace. But when you saw Naash, king of the Ammonites, preparing to attack you, you said to me, No more of this. We want a king to lead us. And God was already your king. So here's the king you wanted, the king you asked for. God has let you have your own way, given you a king. If you fear God, worship and obey him, and don't rebel against what he tells you. If both you and your king follow God, no problem. God will be sure to save you. 
But if you don't obey him and rebel against what he tells you, king or no king, you will fare no better than your fathers. Pay attention. Watch this wonder that God is going to perform before you now. It's summer, as you well know, and the rainy season is over. But I'm going to pray to God. He'll send thunder and rain, a sign to convince you of the great wrong you have done to God by asking for a king. Samuel prayed to God, and God sent thunder and rain that same day. The people were greatly afraid and in awe of God and of Samuel. Then all the people begged Samuel, Pray to your God for us, your servants. Pray that we won't die. On top of all our other sins, we've piled on one more, asking for a king. Samuel said to them, Don't be fearful. It's true that you have done something very wrong. All the same, don't turn your back on God. Worship and serve Him heart and soul. Don't chase after ghost gods. There's nothing to them. They can't help you. They're nothing but ghost gods. God, simply because of who He is, is not going to walk off and leave His people. God took delight in making you into His very own people. And neither will I walk off and leave you. That would be a sin against God. I'm staying right here at my post praying for you and teaching you the good and right way to live. But I beg of you, fear God and worship Him honestly and heartily. You've seen how greatly He has worked among you. Be warned, if you live badly, both you and your king will be thrown out. Saul was a young man when he began as king. He was king over Israel for many years. Saul conscripted enough men for three companies of soldiers. He kept two companies under his command at Michmash and in the Bethel Hills. The other company was under Jonathan at Gibeah in Benjamin. He sent the rest of the men home. Jonathan attacked and killed the Philistine governor stationed at Geba, Gibeah. When the Philistines heard the news, they raised the alarm, the Hebrews are in revolt. Saul ordered the reveille trumpets blown throughout the land. The word went out all over Israel, Saul has killed the Philistine governor, drawn first blood. The Philistines are stirred up and mad as hornets. Summoned, the army came to Saul at Gilgal. The Philistines rallied their forces to fight Israel, three companies of chariots, six companies of cavalry, and so many infantry they looked like sand on the seashore. They went up into the hills and set up camp at Mike Mash, east of Beth Avon. When the Israelites saw that they were way outnumbered and in deep trouble, they ran for cover, hiding in caves and pits, ravines and brambles and cisterns, wherever. They retreated across the Jordan River, refugees fleeing to the country of Gad and Gilead. But Saul held his ground in Gilgal, his soldiers still with him but scared to death. He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel. Samuel failed to show up at Gilgal, and the soldiers were slipping away, right and left. So Saul took charge, bring me the burnt offering and the peace offerings. He went ahead and sacrificed the burnt offering. No sooner had he done it than Samuel showed up. Saul greeted him. Samuel said, What on earth are you doing? Saul answered, When I saw I was losing my army from under me, and that you hadn't come when you said you would, and that the Philistines were poised at Mike Mash, I said, The Philistines are about to come down on me in Gilgal, and I haven't yet come before God asking for his help. So I took things into my own hands, and sacrificed the burnt offering. That was a fool thing to do, Samuel said to Saul. If you had kept the appointment that your God commanded, 
By now God would have set a firm and lasting foundation under your kingly rule over Israel. As it is, your kingly rule is already falling to pieces. God is out looking for your replacement right now. This time he'll do the choosing. When he finds him, he'll appoint him leader of his people. And all because you didn't keep your appointment with God. At that, Samuel got up and left Gilgal. What army there was left followed Saul into battle. They went into the hills from Gilgal toward Gibeah in Benjamin. Saul looked over and assessed the soldiers still with him, a mere six hundred. Saul, his son Jonathan, and the soldiers who had remained made camp at Geba, Gibeah, of Benjamin. The Philistines were camped at Mikmash. Three squads of raiding parties were regularly sent out from the Philistine camp. One squadron was assigned to the Offer Road going toward Shul country, another was assigned to the Beth Horon Road, the third took the border road that rimmed the Valley of Hyenas. There wasn't a blacksmith to be found anywhere in Israel. The Philistines made sure of that, lest those Hebrews start making swords and spears. That meant that the Israelites had to go down among the Philistines to keep their farm tools, plowshares and mattocks, axes and sickles, sharp and in good repair. They charged a silver coin for the plowshares and mattocks, and half that for the rest. So when the battle of Mike Mash was joined, there wasn't a sword or spear to be found anywhere in Israel, except for Saul and his son Jonathan, they were both well armed. A patrol of Philistines took up a position at Mike Mash Pass. Later that day, Jonathan, Saul's son, said to his armor-bearer, Come on, let's go over to the Philistine garrison patrol on the other side of the pass. But he didn't tell his father. Meanwhile, Saul was taking it easy under the pomegranate tree at the threshing floor on the edge of town at Geba, Gibeah. There were about six hundred men with him. Ahijah, wearing the priestly ephod, was also there. Ahijah was the son of Ahitub, brother of Ichabod, son of Phinehas, who was the son of Eli the priest of God at Shiloh. No one there knew that Jonathan had gone off. The pass that Jonathan was planning to cross over to the Philistine garrison was flanked on either side by sharp rock outcroppings, cliffs named Bozes and Sene. The cliff to the north faced Mike Mash, the cliff to the south faced Geba, Gibeah. Jonathan said to his armor-bearer, Come on now, let's go across to these uncircumcised pagans. Maybe God will work for us. There's no rule that says God can only deliver by using a big army. No one can stop God from saving when he sets his mind to it. His armor-bearer said, Go ahead. Do what you think best. I'm with you all the way. Jonathan said, Here's what we'll do. We'll cross over the pass and let the men see we're there. If they say, Halt. Don't move until we check you out, we'll stay put and not go up. But if they say, Come on up, we'll go right up, and we'll know God has given them to us. That will be our sign. So they did it, the two of them. They stepped into the open where they could be seen by the Philistine garrison. The Philistines shouted out, Look at that. The Hebrews are crawling out of their holes. Then they yelled down to Jonathan and his armor-bearer, Come on up here. We've got a thing or two to show you. Jonathan shouted to his armor-bearer, Up! Follow me! God has turned them over to Israel. Jonathan scrambled up on all fours, his armor-bearer right on his heels. When the Philistines came running up to them, he knocked them flat, his armor-bearer right behind finishing them off, bashing their heads in with stones. 
In this first bloody encounter, Jonathan and his armor bearer killed about 20 men. That set off a terrific upheaval in both camp and field, the soldiers in the garrison and the raiding squad badly shaken up, the ground itself shuddering, panic like you've never seen before. Saul's sentries posted back at Geba, Gibeah, in Benjamin saw the confusion and turmoil raging in the camp. Saul commanded, line up and take the roll. See who's here and who's missing. When they called the roll, Jonathan and his armor-bearer turned up missing. Saul ordered Ahijah, bring the priestly ephod. Let's see what God has to say here. Ahijah was responsible for the ephod in those days. While Saul was in conversation with the priest, the upheaval in the Philistine camp became greater and louder. Then Saul interrupted Ahijah, put the ephod away. Saul immediately called his army together and they went straight to the battle. When they got there they found total confusion, Philistines swinging their swords wildly, killing each other. Hebrews who had earlier defected to the Philistine camp came back. They now wanted to be with Israel under Saul and Jonathan. Not only that, but when all the Israelites who had been hiding out in the backwoods of Ephraim heard that the Philistines were running for their lives, they came out and joined the chase. God saved Israel. What a day! The fighting moved on to beth Aven. The whole army was behind Saul now, ten thousand strong, with the fighting scattering into all the towns throughout the hills of Ephraim. Saul did something really foolish that day. He addressed the army, a curse on the man who eats anything before evening, before I've wreaked vengeance on my enemies. None of them ate a thing all day. There were honeycombs here and there in the fields. But no one so much as put his finger in the honey to taste it, for the soldiers to a man feared the curse. But Jonathan hadn't heard his father put the army under oath. He stuck the tip of his staff into some honey and ate it. Refreshed, his eyes lit up with renewed vigor. A soldier spoke up, Your father has put the army under solemn oath, saying, A curse on the man who eats anything before evening. No wonder the soldiers are drooping. Jonathan said, my father has imperiled the country. Just look how quickly my energy has returned since I ate a little of this honey. It would have been a lot better, believe me, if the soldiers had eaten their fill of whatever they took from the enemy. Who knows how much worse we could have whipped them. They killed Philistines that day all the way from Mike Mash to Igelin, but the soldiers ended up totally exhausted. Then they started plundering. They grabbed anything in sight, sheep, cattle, calves, and butchered it where they found it. Then they glutted themselves, meat, blood, the works. Saul was told, do something. The soldiers are sinning against God. They're eating meat with the blood still in it. Saul said, you're biting the hand that feeds you. Roll a big rock over here, now. He continued, Disperse among the troops and tell them, Bring your oxen and sheep to me and butcher them properly here. Then you can feast to your heart's content. Please don't sin against God by eating meat with the blood still in it. And so they did. That night each soldier, one after another, led his animal there to be butchered. That's the story behind Saul's building an altar to God. It's the first altar to God that he built. Saul said, let's go after the Philistines tonight. We can spend the night looting and plundering. We won't leave a single live Philistine. Sounds good to us, said the troops. Let's do it. But the priest slowed them down. Let's find out what God thinks about this. 
So Saul prayed to God, Shall I go after the Philistines? Will you put them in Israel's hand? God didn't answer him on that occasion. Saul then said, All army officers, step forward. Some sin has been committed this day. We're going to find out what it is and who did it. As God lives, Israel's Savior God, whoever sinned will die, even if it should turn out to be Jonathan, my son. Nobody said a word. Saul said to the Israelites, You line up over on that side, and I and Jonathan my son will stand on this side. The army agreed, Fine. Whatever you say. Then Saul prayed to God, O God of Israel, why haven't you answered me today? Show me the truth. If the sin is in me or Jonathan, then, O God, give the sign Urim. But if the sin is in the army of Israel, give the sign Thummim. The Urim sign turned up and pointed to Saul and Jonathan. That cleared the army. Next Saul said, Cast the lots between me and Jonathan, and death to the one God points to. The soldiers protested, No, this is not right. Stop this. But Saul pushed on anyway. They cast the lots, Urim and Thummim, and the lot fell to Jonathan. Saul confronted Jonathan. What did you do? Tell me. Jonathan said, I licked a bit of honey off the tip of the staff I was carrying. That's it, and for that I'm to die. Saul said, Yes. Jonathan most certainly will die. It's out of my hands, I can't go against God, can I? The soldiers rose up, Jonathan, die. Never. He's just carried out this stunning salvation victory for Israel. As surely as God lives, not a hair on his head is going to be harmed. Why, he's been working hand in hand with God all day. The soldiers rescued Jonathan and he didn't die. Saul pulled back from chasing the Philistines, and the Philistines went home. Saul extended his rule capturing neighboring kingdoms. He fought enemies on every front, Moab, Ammon, Edom, the king of Zobah, the Philistines. Wherever he turned, he came up with a victory. He became invincible. He smashed Amalek, freeing Israel from the savagery and looting. Saul's sons were Jonathan, Ishvi, and Malkishwa. His daughters were Merab, the firstborn, and Michael, the younger. Saul's wife was Ahinoam, daughter of Ahamaz. Abner son of Nah was commander of Saul's army, Nah was Saul's uncle. Kish, Saul's father, and Nah, Abner's father, were the sons of Abel. All through Saul's life there was war, bitter and relentless, with the Philistines. Saul conscripted every strong and brave man he laid eyes on. Samuel said to Saul, God sent me to anoint you king over his people, Israel. Now, listen again to what God says. This is the God of the angel army speaking. I'm about to get even with Amalek for ambushing Israel when Israel came up out of Egypt. Here's what you are to do. Go to war against Amalek. Put everything connected with Amalek under a holy ban. And no exceptions. This is to be total destruction, men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys, the works. Saul called the army together at Tel Aim and prepared them to go to war. 200 companies of infantry from Israel and another 10 companies from Judah. Saul marched to Amalek city and hid in the canyon. Then Saul got word to the Kenite, get out of here while you can. Evacuate the city right now or you'll get lumped in with the Amalekites. 
I'm warning you because you showed real kindness to the Israelites when they came up out of Egypt. And they did. The Kenite evacuated the place. Then Saul went after Amalek, from the canyon all the way to Shur near the Egyptian border. He captured Agag, king of Amalek, alive. Everyone else was killed under the terms of the holy ban. Saul and the army made an exception for Agag, and for the choice sheep and cattle. They didn't include them under the terms of the holy ban. But all the rest, which nobody wanted anyway, they destroyed as decreed by the holy ban. Then God spoke to Samuel, I'm sorry I ever made Saul king. He's turned his back on me. He refuses to do what I tell him. Samuel was angry when he heard this. He prayed his anger and disappointment all through the night. He got up early in the morning to confront Saul but was told, Saul's gone. He went to Carmel to set up a victory monument in his own honor, and then was headed for Gilgal. By the time Samuel caught up with him, Saul had just finished an act of worship, having used Amalekite plunder for the burnt offerings sacrifice to God. As Samuel came close, Saul called out, God's blessings on you. I accomplished God's plan to the letter. Samuel said, So what's this I'm hearing, this bleeding of sheep, this mooing of cattle? Only some Amalekite loot, said Saul. The soldiers saved back a few of the choice cattle and sheep to offer up in sacrifice to God. But everything else we destroyed under the holy ban. Enough, interrupted Samuel. Let me tell you what God told me last night. Saul said, Go ahead. Tell me. And Samuel told him. When you started out in this, you were nothing, and you knew it. Then God put you at the head of Israel, made you king over Israel. Then God sent you off to do a job for him, ordering you, Go and put those sinners, the Amalekites, under a holy ban. Go to war against them until you have totally wiped them out. So why did you not obey God? Why did you grab all this loot? Why, with God's eyes on you all the time, did you brazenly carry out this evil? Saul defended himself. What are you talking about? I did obey God. I did the job God set for me. I brought in King Agag and destroyed the Amalekites under the terms of the holy ban. So the soldiers saved back a few choice sheep and cattle from the holy ban for sacrifice to God at Gilgal, what's wrong with that? Then Samuel said, Do you think all God wants are sacrifices? Empty rituals just for show. He wants you to listen to him. Plain listening is the thing. Not staging a lavish religious production. Not doing what God tells you. Is far worse than fooling around in the occult. Getting self-important around God. Is far worse than making deals with your dead ancestors. Because you said no to God's command. He says no to your kingship. Saul gave in and confessed, I've sinned. I've trampled Rashad over God's word and your instructions. I cared more about pleasing the people. I let them tell me what to do. Oh, absolve me of my sin. Take my hand and lead me to the altar so I can worship God. But Samuel refused, No, I can't come alongside you in this. You rejected God's command. Now God has rejected you as king over Israel. As Samuel turned to leave, Saul grabbed at his priestly robe and a piece tore off. Samuel said, God has just now torn the kingdom from you, and handed it over to your neighbor, a better man than you are. Israel's God of glory doesn't deceive and he doesn't dither. 
He says what he means and means what he says. Saul tried again, I have sinned. But don't abandon me. Support me with your presence before the leaders and the people. Come alongside me as I go back to worship God. Samuel did. He went back with him. And Saul dropped to his knees before God and worshipped. Then Samuel said, Present King Agag of Amalek to me. Agag came, dragging his feet, muttering that he'd be better off dead. Samuel said, Just as your sword made many a woman childless, so your mother will be childless among those women. And Samuel cut Agag down in the presence of God right there in Gilgal. Samuel left immediately for Ramah and Saul went home to Gibeah. Samuel had nothing to do with Saul from then on, though he grieved long and deeply over him. But God was sorry he had ever made Saul king in the first place. God addressed Samuel, So, how long are you going to mope over Saul? You know I've rejected him as king over Israel. Fill your flask with anointing oil and get going. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I've spotted the very king I want among his sons. I can't do that, said Samuel. Saul will hear about it and kill me. God said, take a heifer with you and announce, I've come to lead you in worship of God, with this heifer as a sacrifice. Make sure Jesse gets invited. I'll let you know what to do next. I'll point out the one you are to anoint. Samuel did what God told him. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the town fathers greeted him, but apprehensively. Is there something wrong? Nothing's wrong. I've come to sacrifice this heifer and lead you in the worship of God. Prepare yourselves, be consecrated, and join me in worship. He made sure Jesse and his sons were also consecrated and called to worship. When they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, Here he is. God's anointed. But God told Samuel, Looks aren't everything. Don't be impressed with his looks and stature. I've already eliminated him. God judges persons differently than humans do. Men and women look at the face, God looks into the heart. Jesse then called up Abinadab and presented him to Samuel. Samuel said, This man isn't God's choice either. Next Jesse presented Shammah. Samuel said, No, this man isn't either. Jesse presented his seven sons to Samuel. Samuel was blunt with Jesse, God hasn't chosen any of these. Then he asked Jesse, Is this it? Are there no more sons? Well, yes, there's the runt. But he's out tending the sheep. Samuel ordered Jesse, Go get him. We're not moving from this spot until he's here. Jesse sent for him. He was brought in, the very picture of health, bright-eyed, good-looking. God said, Up on your feet. Anoint him. This is the one. Samuel took his flask of oil and anointed him, with his brothers standing around watching. The Spirit of God entered David like a rush of wind, God vitally empowering him for the rest of his life. Samuel left and went home to Ramah. At that very moment the Spirit of God left Saul and in its place a black mood sent by God settled on him. He was terrified. Saul's advisors said, This awful tormenting depression from God is making your life miserable. O oh Master, let us help. Let us look for someone who can play the harp. When the black mood from God moves in, he'll play his music and you'll feel better. Saul told his servants, Go ahead. Find me someone who can play well and bring him to me. 
One of the young men spoke up, I know someone. I've seen him myself, the son of Jesse of Bethlehem, an excellent musician. He's also courageous, of age, well-spoken, and good-looking. And God is with him. So Saul sent messengers to Jesse requesting, Send your son David to me, the one who tends the sheep. Jesse took a donkey, loaded it with a couple of loaves of bread, a flask of wine, and a young goat, and sent his son David with it to Saul. David came to Saul and stood before him. Saul liked him immediately and made him his right-hand man. Saul sent word back to Jesse, Thank you. David will stay here. He's just the one I was looking for. I'm very impressed by him. After that, whenever the bad depression from God tormented Saul, David got out his harp and played. That would calm Saul down, and he would feel better as the moodiness lifted. The Philistines drew up their troops for battle. They deployed them at Soko in Judah, and set up camp between Soko and Ezekah at Ephsdamim. Saul and the Israelites came together, camped at Oak Valley, and spread out their troops in battle readiness for the Philistines. The Philistines were on one hill, the Israelites on the opposing hill, with the valley between them. A giant nearly ten feet tall stepped out from the Philistine line into the open, Goliath from Gath. He had a bronze helmet on his head and was dressed in armor, 126 pounds of it. He wore bronze shin guards and carried a bronze sword. His spear was like a fence rail, the spear tip alone weighed over 15 pounds. His shield bearer walked ahead of him. Goliath stood there and called out to the Israelite troops, Why bother using your whole army? Am I not Philistine enough for you? And you're all committed to Saul, aren't you? So pick your best fighter and pit him against me. If he gets the upper hand and kills me, the Philistines will all become your slaves. But if I get the upper hand and kill him, you'll all become our slaves and serve us. I challenge the troops of Israel this day. Give me a man. Let us fight it out together. When Saul and his troops heard the Philistines' challenge, they were terrified and lost all hope. Enter David. He was the son of Jesse the Ephrathite from Bethlehem in Judah. Jesse, the father of eight sons, was himself too old to join Saul's army. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to war. The names of the three sons who had joined up with Saul were Eliab, the firstborn, next, Abinadab, and third, Shammah. David was the youngest son. While his three oldest brothers went to war with Saul, David went back and forth from attending to Saul to tending his father's sheep in Bethlehem. Each morning and evening for forty days, Goliath took his stand and made his speech. One day, Jesse told David his son, Take this sack of cracked wheat and these ten loaves of bread and run them down to your brothers in the camp. And take these ten wedges of cheese to the captain of their division. Check in on your brothers to see whether they are getting along all right, and let me know how they're doing, Saul and your brothers, and all the Israelites in their war with the Philistines in the Oak Valley. David was up at the crack of dawn and, having arranged for someone to tend his flock, took the food and was on his way just as Jesse had directed him. He arrived at the camp just as the army was moving into battle formation, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines moved into position, facing each other, battle ready. David left his bundles of food in the care of a sentry, ran to the troops who were deployed, and greeted his brothers. While they were talking together, the Philistine champion, Goliath of Gath, stepped out from the front lines of the Philistines, and gave his usual challenge. 
David heard him. The Israelites, to a man, fell back the moment they saw the giant, totally frightened. The talk among the troops was, have you ever seen anything like this, this man openly and defiantly challenging Israel? The man who kills the giant will have it made. The king will give him a huge reward, offer his daughter as a bride, and give his entire family a free ride. David, who was talking to the men standing around him, asked, What's in it for the man who kills that Philistine and gets rid of this ugly blot on Israel's honor? Who does he think he is, anyway, this uncircumcised Philistine, taunting the armies of God alive? They told him what everyone was saying about what the king would do for the man who killed the Philistine. Eliab, his older brother, heard David fraternizing with the men and lost his temper, What are you doing here? Why aren't you minding your own business, tending that scrawny flock of sheep? I know what you're up to. You've come down here to see the sights, hoping for a ringside seat at a bloody battle. What is it with you, replied David. All I did was ask a question. Ignoring his brother, he turned to someone else, asked the same question, and got the same answer as before. The things David was saying were picked up and reported to Saul. Saul sent for him. Master, said David, don't give up hope. I'm ready to go and fight this Philistine. Saul answered David, you can't go and fight this Philistine. You're too young and inexperienced, and he's been at this fighting business since before you were born. David said, I've been a shepherd, tending sheep for my father. Whenever a lion or bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I'd go after it, knock it down, and rescue the lamb. If it turned on me, I'd grab it by the throat, wring its neck, and kill it. Lion or bear, it made no difference, I killed it. And I'll do the same to this Philistine pig who is taunting the troops of God alive. God, who delivered me from the teeth of the lion and the claws of the bear, will deliver me from this Philistine. Saul said, Go. And God help you. Then Saul outfitted David as a soldier in armor. He put his bronze helmet on his head and belted his sword on him over the armor. David tried to walk but he could hardly budge. David told Saul, I can't even move with all this stuff on me. I'm not used to this. And he took it all off. Then David took his shepherd's staff, selected five smooth stones from the brook, and put them in the pocket of his shepherd's pack, and with his sling in his hand approached Goliath. As the Philistine paced back and forth, his shield-bearer in front of him, he noticed David. He took one look down on him and sneered, a mere boy, apple-cheeked and peach-fuzzed. The Philistine ridiculed David. Am I a dog that you come after me with a stick? And he cursed him by his gods. Come on, said the Philistine. I'll make roadkill of you for the buzzards. I'll turn you into a tasty morsel for the field mice. David answered, You come at me with sword and spear and battle axe. I come at you in the name of God of the angel armies, the God of Israel's troops, whom you curse and mock. This very day God is handing you over to me. I'm about to kill you, cut off your head, and serve up your body in the bodies of your Philistine buddies to the crows and coyotes. The whole earth will know that there's an extraordinary God in Israel. And everyone gathered here will learn that God doesn't save by means of sword or spear. The battle belongs to God, He's handing you to us on a platter. That roused the Philistine, and he started toward David. David took off from the front line, running toward the Philistine. David reached into his pocket for a stone, slung it, 
and hit the Philistine hard in the forehead, embedding the stone deeply. The Philistine crashed, face down in the dirt. That's how David beat the Philistine, with a sling and a stone. He hit him and killed him. No sword for David. Then David ran up to the Philistine and stood over him, pulled the giant's sword from its sheath, and finished the job by cutting off his head. When the Philistines saw that their great champion was dead, they scattered, running for their lives. The men of Israel and Judah were up on their feet, shouting. They chased the Philistines all the way to the outskirts of Gath and the gates of Ekron. Wounded Philistines were strewn along the Sharaim road all the way to Gath and Ekron. After chasing the Philistines, the Israelites came back and looted their camp. David took the Philistines' head and brought it to Jerusalem. But the giant's weapons he placed in his own tent. When Saul saw David go out to meet the Philistine, he said to Abner, commander of the army, tell me about this young man's family. Abner said, For the life of me, O king, I don't know. The king said, Well, find out the lineage of this raw youth. As soon as David came back from killing the Philistine, Abner brought him, the Philistine's head still in his hand, straight to Saul. Saul asked him, Young man, whose son are you? I'm the son of your servant Jesse, said David, the one who lives in Bethlehem. By the time David had finished reporting to Saul, Jonathan was deeply impressed with David, an immediate bond was forged between them. He became totally committed to David. From that point on he would be David's number one advocate and friend. Saul received David into his own household that day, no more to return to the home of his father. Jonathan, out of his deep love for David, made a covenant with him. He formalized it with solemn gifts, his own royal robe and weapons, armor, sword, bow, and belt. Whatever Saul gave David to do, he did it, and did it well. So well that Saul put him in charge of his military operations. Everybody, both the people in general and Saul's servants, approved of and admired David's leadership. As they returned home, after David had killed the Philistine, the women poured out of all the villages of Israel singing and dancing, welcoming King Saul with tambourines, festive songs, and lutes. In playful frolic the women sang, Saul kills by the thousand, David by the ten thousand. This made Saul angry, very angry. He took it as a personal insult. He said, they credit David with ten thousands and me with only thousands. Before you know it they'll be giving him the kingdom. From that moment on, Saul kept his eye on David. The next day an ugly mood was sent by God to afflict Saul, who became quite beside himself, raving. David played his harp, as he usually did at such times. Saul had a spear in his hand. Suddenly Saul threw the spear, thinking, I'll nail David to the wall. David ducked, and the spear missed. This happened twice. Now Saul feared David. It was clear that God was with David and had left Saul. So, Saul got David out of his sight by making him an officer in the army. David was in combat frequently. Everything David did turned out well. Yes, God was with him. As Saul saw David becoming more successful, he himself grew more fearful. He could see the handwriting on the wall. But everyone else in Israel and Judah loved David. They loved watching him in action. One day Saul said to David, Here is Merab, my eldest daughter. I want to give her to you as your wife. Be brave and bold for my sake. 
fight God's battles. But all the time Saul was thinking, the Philistines will kill him for me. I won't have to lift a hand against him. David, embarrassed, answered, Do you really mean that? I'm from a family of nobodies. I can't be son-in-law to the king. The wedding day was set, but as the time neared for Merab and David to be married, Saul reneged and married his daughter off to Adriel the Mahalathite. Meanwhile, Saul's daughter Michael was in love with David. When Saul was told of this, he rubbed his hands in anticipation. Ah, a second chance. I'll use Michael as bait to get David out where the Philistines will make short work of him. So again he said to David, you're going to be my son-in-law. Saul ordered his servants, get David off by himself and tell him, the king is very taken with you, and everyone at court loves you. Go ahead, become the king's son-in-law. The king's servants told all this to David, but David held back. What are you thinking of? I can't do that. I'm a nobody, I have nothing to offer. When the servants reported David's response to Saul, he told them to tell David this, The king isn't expecting any money from you, only this, go kill a hundred Philistines and bring evidence of your vengeance on the king's behalf. Avenge the king on his enemies. Saul expected David to be killed in action. On receiving this message, David was pleased. There was something he could do for the king that would qualify him to be his son-in-law. He lost no time but went right out, he and his men, killed the hundred Philistines, brought their evidence back in a sack, and counted it out before the king, mission completed. Saul gave Michael his daughter to David in marriage. As Saul more and more realized that God was with David, and how much his own daughter, Michael, loved him, his fear of David increased and settled into hate. Saul hated David. Whenever the Philistine warlords came out to battle, David was there to meet them, and beat them, upstaging Saul's men. David's name was on everyone's lips. Saul called his son Jonathan together with his servants and ordered them to kill David. But because Jonathan treasured David, he went and warned him, My father is looking for a way to kill you. Here's what you are to do. Tomorrow morning, hide and stay hidden. I'll go out with my father into the field where you are hiding. I'll talk about you with my father and we'll see what he says. Then I'll report back to you. Jonathan brought up David with his father, speaking well of him. Please, he said to his father, don't attack David. He hasn't wronged you, has he? And just look at all the good he has done. He put his life on the line when he killed the Philistine. What a great victory God gave Israel that day. You were there. You saw it and were on your feet applauding with everyone else. So why would you even think of sinning against an innocent person, killing David for no reason whatever? Saul listened to Jonathan and said, You're right. As God lives, David lives. He will not be killed. Jonathan sent for David and reported to him everything that was said. Then he brought David back to Saul and everything was as it was before. War broke out again and David went out to fight Philistines. He beat them badly, and they ran for their lives. But then a black mood from God settled over Saul and took control of him. He was sitting at home, his spear in his hand, while David was playing music. Suddenly, Saul tried to skewer David with his spear, but David ducked. The spear stuck in the wall and David got away. It was night. Saul sent men to David's house to stake it out and then, first thing in the morning, to kill him. But Michael, David's wife, 
told him what was going on. Quickly now, make your escape tonight. If not, you'll be dead by morning. She let him out of a window, and he made his escape. Then Michael took a dummy god and put it in the bed, placed a wig of goat's hair on its head, and threw a quilt over it. When Saul's men arrived to get David, she said, he's sick in bed. Saul sent his men back, ordering them, bring him, bed and all, so I can kill him. When the men entered the room, all they found in the bed was the dummy god with its goat hair wig. Saul stormed at Michael, how could you play tricks on me like this? You sided with my enemy, and now he's gotten away. Michael said, he threatened me. He said, help me out of here or I'll kill you. David made good his escape and went to Samuel at Ramah and told him everything Saul had done to him. Then he and Samuel withdrew to the privacy of Naoth. Saul was told, David's at Naoth in Ramah. He immediately sent his men to capture him. They saw a band of prophets prophesying with Samuel presiding over them. Before they knew it, the Spirit of God was on them, too, and they were ranting and raving right along with the prophets. That was reported back to Saul, and he dispatched more men. They, too, were soon prophesying. So Saul tried a third time, a third set of men and they ended up mindlessly raving as well. Fed up, Saul went to Rama himself. He came to the big cistern at CCU and inquired, Where are Samuel and David? A bystander said, Over at Naoth in Rama. As he headed out for Naoth in Rama, the Spirit of God was on him, too. All the way to Naoth he was caught up in a babbling trance. He ripped off his clothes and lay there rambling gibberish before Samuel for a day and a night, stretched out naked. People are still talking about it, Saul among the prophets. Who would have guessed? David got out of Naoth in Ramah alive and went to Jonathan. What do I do now? What wrong have I inflicted on your father that makes him so determined to kill me? Nothing said Jonathan. You've done nothing wrong. And you're not going to die. Really, you're not. My father tells me everything. He does nothing, whether big or little, without confiding in me. So why would he do this behind my back? It can't be. But David said, your father knows that we are the best of friends. So he says to himself, Jonathan must know nothing of this. If he does, he'll side with David. But it's true, as sure as God lives, and as sure as you're alive before me right now, he's determined to kill me. Jonathan said, tell me what you have in mind. I'll do anything for you. David said, tomorrow marks the new moon. I'm scheduled to eat dinner with the king. Instead, I'll go hide in the field until the evening of the third. If your father misses me, say, David asked if he could run down to Bethlehem, his hometown, for an anniversary reunion, and worship with his family. If he says, good, then I'm safe. But if he gets angry, you'll know for sure that he's made up his mind to kill me. Oh, stick with me in this. You've entered into a covenant of God with me, remember. If I'm in the wrong, go ahead and kill me yourself. Why bother giving me up to your father? Never, exclaimed Jonathan. I'd never do that. If I get the slightest hint that my father is fixated on killing you, I'll tell you. David asked, and whom will you get to tell me if your father comes back with a harsh answer? Come outside, said Jonathan. Let's go to the field. When the two of them were out in the field, Jonathan said, 
As God, the God of Israel, is my witness, by this time tomorrow I'll get it out of my father how he feels about you. Then I'll let you know what I learn. May God do his worst to me if I let you down. If my father still intends to kill you, I'll tell you and get you out of here in one piece. And God be with you as he's been with my father. If I make it through this alive, continue to be my covenant friend. And if I die, keep the covenant friendship with my family, forever. And when God finally rids the earth of David's enemies, stay loyal to Jonathan. Jonathan repeated his pledge of love and friendship for David. He loved David more than his own soul. Jonathan then laid out his plan, tomorrow is the new moon, and you'll be missed when you don't show up for dinner. On the third day, when they've quit expecting you, come to the place where you hid before, and wait beside that big boulder. I'll shoot three arrows in the direction of the boulder. Then I'll send off my servant, go find the arrows. If I yell after the servant, the arrows are on this side. Retrieve them, that's the signal that you can return safely, as God lives, not a thing to fear. But if I yell, the arrows are farther out, then run for it, God wants you out of here. Regarding all the things we've discussed, remember that God's in on this with us to the very end. David hid in the field. On the holiday of the new moon, the king came to the table to eat. He sat where he always sat, the place against the wall, with Jonathan across the table and Abner at Saul's side. But David's seat was empty. Saul didn't mention it at the time, thinking, something's happened that's made him unclean. That's it, he's probably unclean for the holy meal. But the day after the new moon, day two of the holiday, David's seat was still empty. Saul asked Jonathan his son, so where's that son of Jesse? He hasn't eaten with us either yesterday or today. Jonathan said, David asked my special permission to go to Bethlehem. He said, give me leave to attend a family reunion back home. My brothers have ordered me to be there. If it seems all right to you, let me go and see my brothers. That's why he's not here at the king's table. Saul exploded in anger at Jonathan, you son of a slut. Don't you think I know that you're in cahoots with the son of Jesse, disgracing both you and your mother? For as long as the son of Jesse is walking around free on this earth, your future in this kingdom is at risk. Now go get him. Bring him here. From this moment, he's as good as dead. Jonathan stood up to his father. Why dead? What's he done? Saul threw his spear at him to kill him. That convinced Jonathan that his father was fixated on killing David. Jonathan stormed from the table, furiously angry, and ate nothing the rest of the day, upset for David and smarting under the humiliation from his father. In the morning, Jonathan went to the field for the appointment with David. He had his young servant with him. He told the servant, run and get the arrows I'm about to shoot. The boy started running and Jonathan shot an arrow way beyond him. As the boy came to the area where the arrow had been shot, Jonathan yelled out, isn't the arrow farther out? He yelled again, hurry. Quickly. Don't just stand there. Jonathan's servant then picked up the arrow and brought it to his master. The boy, of course, knew nothing of what was going on. Only Jonathan and David knew. Jonathan gave his quiver and bow to the boy and sent him back to town. After the servant was gone, David got up from his hiding place beside the boulder, then fell on his face to the ground, three times prostrating himself. And then they kissed one another and wept, 
friend over friend, David weeping especially hard. Jonathan said, Go in peace. The two of us have vowed friendship in God's name, saying, God will be the bond between me and you, and between my children and your children forever. David went on his way and Jonathan returned to town. David went to Nob, to Ahimelech the priest. Ahimelech was alarmed as he went out to greet David, What are you doing here all by yourself, and not a soul with you? David answered Ahimelech the priest, The king sent me on a mission and gave strict orders, This is top secret, not a word of this to a soul. I've arranged to meet up with my men in a certain place. Now, what's there here to eat? Do you have five loaves of bread? Give me whatever you can scrounge up. I don't have any regular bread on hand, said the priest. I only have holy bread. If your men have not slept with women recently, it's yours. David said, None of us has touched a woman. I always do it this way when I'm on a mission, my men abstain from sex. Even when it is an ordinary mission we do that, how much more on this holy mission. So the priest gave them the holy bread. It was the only bread he had, bread of the presence that had been removed from God's presence and replaced by fresh bread at the same time. One of Saul's officials was present that day keeping a religious vow. His name was Dob the Edomite. He was chief of Saul's shepherds. David asked Ahimelech, Do you have a spear or sword of any kind around here? I didn't have a chance to grab my weapons. The king's mission was urgent and I left in a hurry. The priest said, The sword of Goliath, the Philistine you killed at Oak Valley, that's here. It's behind the ephod wrapped in a cloth. If you want it, take it. There's nothing else here. Oh, said David, there's no sword like that. Give it to me. And at that, David shot out of there, running for his life from Saul. He went to Achish, king of Gath. When the servants of Achish saw him, they said, Can this be David, the famous David? Is this the one they sing of at their dances? Saul kills by the thousand. David by the ten thousand. When David realized that he had been recognized, he panicked, fearing the worst from Achish, king of Gath. So right there, while they were looking at him, he pretended to go crazy, pounding his head on the city gate and foaming at the mouth, spit dripping from his beard. Achish took one look at him and said to his servants, Can't you see he's crazy? Why did you let him in here? Don't you think I have enough crazy people to put up with as it is without adding another? Get him out of here. So David got away and escaped to the cave of Adullam. When his brothers and others associated with his family heard where he was, they came down and joined him. Not only that, but all who were down on their luck came around, losers and vagrants and misfits of all sorts. David became their leader. There were about four hundred in all. Then David went to Mizpah in Moab. He petitioned the king of Moab, Grant asylum to my father and mother until I find out what God has planned for me. David left his parents in the care of the king of Moab. They stayed there all through the time David was hiding out. The prophet Gad told David, Don't go back to the cave. Go to Judah. David did what he told him. He went to the forest of Hereth. Saul got word of the whereabouts of David and his men. He was sitting under the big oak on the hill at Gibeah at the time, spear in hand, holding court surrounded by his officials. He said, Listen here, you Benjaminites. Don't think for a minute that you have any future with the son of Jesse. Do you think he's going to hand over choice land, 
give you all influential jobs. Think again. Here you are, conspiring against me, whispering behind my back. Not one of you is man enough to tell me that my own son is making deals with the son of Jesse, not one of you who cares enough to tell me that my son has taken the side of this, this, outlaw. Then Dog the Edomite, who was standing with Saul's officials, spoke up, I saw the son of Jesse meet with Ahimelech son of Ahitub, in Nob. I saw Ahimelech pray with him for God's guidance, give him food, and arm him with the sword of Goliath the Philistine. Saul sent for the priest Ahimelech son of Ahitub, along with the whole family of priests at Nob. They all came to the king. Saul said, You listen to me, son of Ahitub. Certainly, master, he said. Why have you ganged up against me with the son of Jesse, giving him bread and a sword, even praying with him for God's guidance, setting him up as an outlaw, out to get me? Ahimelech answered the king, There's not an official in your administration as true to you as David, your own son-in-law and captain of your bodyguard. None more honorable either. Do you think that was the first time I prayed with him for God's guidance? Hardly. But don't accuse me of any wrongdoing, me or my family. I have no idea what you're trying to get at with this outlaw talk. The king said, Death, Ahimelech. You're going to die, you and everyone in your family. The king ordered his henchmen, surround and kill the priests of God their hand in glove with David. They knew he was running away from me and didn't tell me. But the king's men wouldn't do it. They refused to lay a hand on the priests of God. Then the king told Dog, you do it, massacre the priests. Dog the Edomite led the attack and slaughtered the priests, the eighty-five men who wore the sacred robes. He then carried the massacre into Nob, the city of priests, killing man and woman, child and baby, ox, donkey, and sheep, the works. Only one son of Ahimelech son of Ahitub escaped, Abiathar. He got away and joined up with David. Abiathar reported to David that Saul had murdered the priests of God. David said to Abiathar, I knew it. That day I saw Dog the Edomite there, I knew he'd tell Saul. I'm to blame for the death of everyone in your father's family. Stay here with me. Don't be afraid. The one out to kill you is out to kill me, too. Stick with me. I'll protect you. It was reported to David that the Philistines were raiding Keilah and looting the grain. David went in prayer to God, should I go after these Philistines and teach them a lesson? God said, go. Attack the Philistines and save Keilah. But David's men said, we live in fear of our lives right here in Judah. How can you think of going to Keilah in the thick of the Philistines? So David went back to God in prayer. God said, get going. Head for Kila. I'm placing the Philistines in your hands. David and his men went to Kila and fought the Philistines. He scattered their cattle, beat them decisively, and saved the people of Kila. After Abiathar took refuge with David, he joined David in the raid on Kila, bringing the ephod with him. Saul learned that David had gone to Kila and thought immediately, Good. God has handed him to me on a platter. He's in a walled city with locked gates, trapped. Saul mustered his troops for battle and set out for Keilah to lay siege to David and his men. But David got wind of Saul's strategy to destroy him and said to Abiathar the priest, Get the ephod. Then David prayed to God, God of Israel, I've just heard that Saul plans to come to Keilah and destroy the city because of me. 
Will the city fathers of Keilah turn me over to him? Will Saul come down and do what I've heard? O God, God of Israel, tell me. God replied, He's coming down. And will the head men of Keilah turn me and my men over to Saul? And God said, They'll turn you over. So David and his men got out of there. There were about six hundred of them. They left Keilah and kept moving, going here, there, wherever, always on the move. When Saul was told that David had escaped from Keilah, he called off the raid. David continued to live in desert hideouts and the backcountry wilderness hills of Ziph. Saul was out looking for him day after day, but God never turned David over to him. David kept out of the way in the wilderness of Ziph, secluded at Horish, since it was plain that Saul was determined to hunt him down. Jonathan, Saul's son, visited David at Horish and encouraged him in God. He said, Don't despair. My father, Saul, can't lay a hand on you. You will be Israel's king and I'll be right at your side to help. And my father knows it. Then the two of them made a covenant before God. David stayed at Horish and Jonathan went home. Some Ziphites went to Saul at Gibeah and said, Did you know that David is hiding out near us in the caves and canyons of Horish? Right now he's at Hekila Hill just south of Jeshimon. So whenever you're ready to come down, we'd count it an honor to hand him over to the king. Saul said, God bless you for thinking about me. Now go back and check everything out. Learn his routines. Observe his movements, where he goes, who he's with. He's very shrewd, you know. Scout out all his hiding places. Then meet me at Nacon and I'll go with you. If he is anywhere to be found in all the thousands of Judah, I'll track him down. So the Ziphites set out on their reconnaissance for Saul. Meanwhile, David and his men were in the wilderness of Maon, in the desert south of Jeshimon. Saul and his men arrived and began their search. When David heard of it, he went south to Rock Mountain, camping out in the wilderness of Maon. Saul heard where he was and set off for the wilderness of Maon in pursuit. Saul was on one side of the mountain, David and his men on the other. David was in full retreat, running, with Saul and his men closing in, about to get him. Just then a messenger came to Saul and said, Hurry! Come back! The Philistines have just attacked the country. So Saul called off his pursuit of David and went back to deal with the Philistines. That's how that place got the name Narrow Escape. David left there and camped out in the caves and canyons of En Gedi. When Saul came back after dealing with the Philistines, he was told, David is now in the wilderness of En Gedi. Saul took three companies, the best he could find in all Israel, and set out in search of David and his men in the region of wild goat rocks. He came to some sheep pens along the road. There was a cave there and Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were huddled far back in the same cave. David's men whispered to him, Can you believe it? This is the day God was talking about when he said, I'll put your enemy in your hands. You can do whatever you want with him. Quiet as a cat, David crept up and cut off a piece of Saul's royal robe. Immediately, he felt guilty. He said to his men, God forbid that I should have done this to my master, God's anointed, that I should so much as raise a finger against him. He's God's anointed. David held his men in check with these words and wouldn't let them pounce on Saul. Saul got up, left the cave, and went on down the road. Then David stood at the mouth of the cave and called to Saul, my master. 
My king. Saul looked back. David fell to his knees and bowed in reverence. He called out, Why do you listen to those who say, David is out to get you? This very day with your very own eyes you have seen that just now in the cave God put you in my hands. My men wanted me to kill you, but I wouldn't do it. I told them that I won't lift a finger against my master, he's God's anointed. Oh, my father, look at this, look at this piece that I cut from your robe. I could have cut you, killed you, but I didn't. Look at the evidence. I'm not against you. I'm no rebel. I haven't sinned against you, and yet you're hunting me down to kill me. Let's decide which of us is in the right. God may avenge me, but it is in his hands, not mine. An old proverb says, evil deeds come from evil people. So be assured that my hand won't touch you. What does the king of Israel think he's doing? Who do you think you're chasing? A dead dog? A flea? God is our judge. He'll decide who is right. Oh, that he would look down right now, decide right now, and set me free of you. When David had finished saying all this, Saul said, Can this be the voice of my son David? And he wept in loud sobs. You're the one in the right, not me, he continued. You've heaped good on me, I've dumped evil on you. And now you've done it again, treated me generously. God put me in your hands and you didn't kill me. Why? When a man meets his enemy, does he send him down the road with a blessing? May God give you a bonus of blessings for what you've done for me today. I know now beyond doubt that you will rule as king. The kingdom of Israel is already in your grasp. Now promise me under God that you will not kill off my family or wipe my name off the books. David promised Saul. Then Saul went home and David and his men went up to their wilderness refuge. Samuel died. The whole country came to his funeral. Everyone grieved over his death, and he was buried in his hometown of Ramah. Meanwhile, David moved again, this time to the wilderness of Maon. There was a certain man in Maon who carried on his business in the region of Carmel. He was very prosperous, three thousand sheep and a thousand goats, and it was sheep shearing time in Carmel. The man's name was Nabal, fool, a kalebite, and his wife's name was Abigail. The woman was intelligent and good-looking, the man brutish and mean. David, out in the backcountry, heard that Nabal was shearing his sheep and sent ten of his young men off with these instructions, go to Carmel and approach Nabal. Greet him in my name, peace. Life and peace to you. Peace to your household, peace to everyone here. I heard that it's sheep shearing time. Here's the point, when your shepherds were camped near us we didn't take advantage of them. They didn't lose a thing all the time they were with us in Carmel. Ask your young men, they'll tell you. What I'm asking is that you be generous with my men, share the feast. Give whatever your heart tells you to your servants and to me, David your son. David's young men went and delivered his message word for word to Nabal. Nabal tore into them, Who is this David? Who is this son of Jesse? The country is full of runaway servants these days. Do you think I'm going to take good bread and wine and meat freshly butchered for my sheep shearers and give it to men I've never laid eyes on? Who knows where they've come from? David's men got out of there and went back and told David what he had said. David said, Strap on your swords. They all strapped on their swords, David and his men, and set out, four hundred of them. Two hundred stayed behind to guard the camp. 
Meanwhile, one of the young shepherds told Abigail, Nabal's wife, what had happened. David sent messengers from the backcountry to salute our master, but he tore into them with insults. Yet these men treated us very well. They took nothing from us and didn't take advantage of us all the time we were in the fields. They formed a wall around us, protecting us day and night all the time we were out tending the sheep. Do something quickly because big trouble is ahead for our master and all of us. Nobody can talk to him. He's impossible, a real brute. Abigail flew into action. She took two hundred loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five sheep dressed out and ready for cooking, a bushel of roasted grain, a hundred raisin cakes, and two hundred fig cakes, and she had it all loaded on some donkeys. Then she said to her young servants, Go ahead and pave the way for me. I'm right behind you. But she said nothing to her husband Nabal. As she was riding her donkey, descending into a ravine, David and his men were descending from the other end, so they met there on the road. David had just said, that sure was a waste, guarding everything this man had out in the wild so that nothing he had was lost, and now he rewards me with insults. A real slap in the face. May God do his worst to me if Nabal and every cur in his misbegotten brood aren't dead meat by morning. As soon as Abigail saw David, she got off her donkey and fell on her knees at his feet, her face to the ground in homage, saying, My master, let me take the blame. Let me speak to you. Listen to what I have to say. Don't dwell on what that brute Nabal did. He acts out the meaning of his name, Nabal, fool. Foolishness oozes from him. I wasn't there when the young men my master sent arrived. I didn't see them. And now, my master, as God lives and as you live, God has kept you from this avenging murder, and may your enemies, all who seek my master's harm, end up like Nabal. Now take this gift that I, your servant girl, have brought to my master, and give it to the young men who follow in the steps of my master. Forgive my presumption. But God is at work in my master, developing a rule solid and dependable. My master fights God's battles. As long as you live no evil will stick to you. If anyone stands in your way, if anyone tries to get you out of the way, know this, your God-honored life is tightly bound in the bundle of God-protected life. But the lives of your enemies will be hurled aside as a stone is thrown from a sling. When God completes all the goodness He has promised my Master and sets you up as Prince over Israel, my master will not have this dead weight in his heart, the guilt of an avenging murder. And when God has worked things for good for my master, remember me. And David said, Blessed be God, the God of Israel. He sent you to meet me. And blessed be your good sense. Bless you for keeping me from murder and taking charge of looking out for me. A close call. As God lives, the God of Israel who kept me from hurting you, if you had not come as quickly as you did, stopping me in my tracks, by morning there would have been nothing left of Nabal but dead meat. Then David accepted the gift she brought him and said, Return home in peace. I've heard what you've said and I'll do what you've asked. When Abigail got home she found Nabal presiding over a huge banquet. He was in high spirits, and very, very drunk. So she didn't tell him anything of what she'd done until morning. But in the morning, after Nabal had sobered up, she told him the whole story. Right then and there he had a heart attack and fell into a coma. About ten days later God finished him off and he died. When David heard that Nabal was dead he said, 
Blessed be God who has stood up for me against Nabal's insults, kept me from an evil act, and let Nabal's evil boomerang back on him. Then David sent for Abigail to tell her that he wanted her for his wife. David's servants went to Abigail at Carmel with the message, David sent us to bring you to marry him. She got up, and then bowed down, face to the ground, saying, I'm your servant, ready to do anything you want. I'll even wash the feet of my master's servants. Abigail didn't linger. She got on her donkey and, with her five maids in attendance, went with the messengers to David and became his wife. David also married a Hinom of Jezreel. Both women were his wives. Saul had married off David's wife Michael to Palti, Paltiel, son of Lysh, who was from Galim. Some Ziphites came to Saul at Gibeah and said, Did you know that David is hiding out on the Hekelah hill just opposite Jeshimon? Saul was on his feet in a minute and on his way to the wilderness of Ziph, taking three thousand of his best men, the pick of the crop, to hunt for David in that wild desert. He camped just off the road at the Hekelah hill, opposite Jeshimon. David, still out in the backcountry, knew Saul had come after him. He sent scouts to determine his precise location. Then David set out and came to the place where Saul had set up camp and saw for himself where Saul and Abner, son of Neh, his general, were staying. Saul was safely inside the camp, encircled by the army. Taking charge, David spoke to Ahimelech the Hittite and to Abishai son of Zeruiah, Joab's brother, who will go down with me and enter Saul's camp. Abishai whispered, I'll go with you. So David and Abishai entered the encampment by night, and there he was, Saul, stretched out asleep at the center of the camp, his spear stuck in the ground near his head, with Abner and the troops sound asleep on all sides. Abishai said, This is the moment. God has put your enemy in your grasp. Let me nail him to the ground with his spear. One hit will do it, believe me, I won't need a second. But David said to Abishai, Don't you dare hurt him. Who could lay a hand on God's anointed and even think of getting away with it? He went on, As God lives, either God will strike him, or his time will come and he'll die in bed, or he'll fall in battle, but God forbid that I should lay a finger on God's anointed. Now, grab the spear at his head and the water jug and let's get out of here. David took the spear and water jug that were right beside Saul's head, and they slipped away. Not a soul saw. Not a soul knew. No one woke up. They all slept through the whole thing. A blanket of deep sleep from God had fallen on them. Then David went across to the opposite hill and stood far away on the top of the mountain. With this safe distance between them, he shouted across to the army in Abner son of Neb, Hey, Abner! How long do I have to wait for you to wake up and answer me? Abner said, Who's calling? Aren't you in charge there, said David. Why aren't you minding the store? Why weren't you standing guard over your master the king, when a soldier came to kill the king your master? Bad form. As God lives, your life should be forfeit, you and the entire bodyguard. Look what I have, the king's spear and water jug that were right beside his head. By now, Saul had recognized David's voice and said, Is that you, my son David? David said, Yes, it's me, O king, my master. Why are you after me, hunting me down? What have I done? What crime have I committed? Oh, my master, my king, listen to this from your servant. If God has stirred you up against me, then I gladly offer my life as a sacrifice. But if it's men who have done it, 
let them be banished from God's presence. They've expelled me from my rightful place in God's heritage, sneering, out of here. Go get a job with some other God. But you're not getting rid of me that easily, you'll not separate me from God in life or death. The Absurdity The King of Israel obsessed with a single flea. Hunting me down, a mere partridge, out in the hills. Saul confessed, I've sinned. Oh, come back, my dear son David. I won't hurt you anymore. You've honored me this day, treating my life as most precious. And I've acted the fool, a moral dunce, a real clown. David answered, see what I have here. The king's spear. Let one of your servants come and get it. It's God's business to decide what to do with each of us in regard to what's right and who's loyal. God put your life in my hands today, but I wasn't willing to lift a finger against God's anointed. Just as I honored your life today, may God honor my life and rescue me from all trouble. Saul said to David, Bless you, dear son David. Yes, do what you have to do. And, yes, succeed in all you attempt. Then David went on his way, and Saul went home. David thought to himself, sooner or later, Saul's going to get me. The best thing I can do is escape to Philistine country. Saul will count me a lost cause and quit hunting me down in every nook and cranny of Israel. I'll be out of his reach for good. So David left, he and his six hundred men went to Achish son of Mauch, king of Gath. They moved in and settled down in Gath, with Achish. Each man brought his household, David brought his two wives, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, widow of Nabal of Carmel. When Saul was told that David had escaped to Gath, he called off the hunt. Then David said to Achish, If it's agreeable to you, assign me a place in one of the rural villages. It doesn't seem right that I, your mere servant, should be taking up space in the royal city. So Achish assigned him Ziklag. This is how Ziklag got to be what it is now, a city of the kings of Judah. David lived in Philistine country a year and four months. From time to time David and his men raided the Jeshurites, the Gerzites, and the Amalekites, these people were long-time inhabitants of the land stretching toward Shur and on to Egypt. When David raided an area he left no one alive, neither man nor woman, but took everything else, sheep, cattle, donkeys, camels, clothing, the works. Then he'd return to Achish. Achish would ask, And whom did you raid today? David would tell him, Oh, the Negev of Judah, or the Negev of Jeremiel, or the Negev of the Kenite. He never left a single person alive lest one show up in Gath and report what David had really been doing. This is the way David operated all the time he lived in Philistine country. Achish came to trust David completely. He thought, he's made himself so repugnant to his people that he'll be in my camp forever. During this time the Philistines mustered their troops to make war on Israel. Achish said to David, You can count on this, you're marching with my troops, you and your men. And David said, Good. Now you'll see for yourself what I can do. Great, said Achish. I'm making you my personal bodyguard, for life. Samuel was now dead. All Israel had mourned his death and buried him in Ramah, his hometown. Saul had long since cleaned out all those who held seances with the dead. The Philistines had mustered their troops and camped at Shunem. Saul had assembled all Israel and camped at Gilboa. But when Saul saw the Philistine troops, he shook in his boots, 
scared to death. Saul prayed to God, but God didn't answer, neither by dream nor by sign nor by prophet. So Saul ordered his officials, Find me someone who can call up spirits so I may go and seek counsel from those spirits. His servant said, There's a witch at Ender. Saul disguised himself by putting on different clothes. Then, taking two men with him, he went under the cover of night to the woman and said, I want you to consult a ghost for me. Call up the person I name. The woman said, Just hold on now. You know what Saul did, how he swept the country clean of mediums. Why are you trying to trap me and get me killed? Saul swore solemnly, as God lives, you won't get in any trouble for this. The woman said, so whom do you want me to bring up? Samuel. Bring me Samuel. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out loudly to Saul, why did you lie to me? You're Saul. The king told her, you have nothing to fear, but what do you see? I see a spirit ascending from the underground. And what does he look like? Saul asked. An old man ascending, robed like a priest. Saul knew it was Samuel. He fell down, face to the ground, and worshipped. Samuel said to Saul, why have you disturbed me by calling me up? Because I'm in deep trouble, said Saul. The Philistines are making war against me and God has deserted me, he doesn't answer me anymore either by prophet or by dream. And so I'm calling on you to tell me what to do. Why ask me, said Samuel. God has turned away from you and is now on the side of your neighbor. God has done exactly what he told you through me, ripped the kingdom right out of your hands and given it to your neighbor. It's because you did not obey God, refused to carry out his seething judgment on Amalek, that God does to you what he is doing today. Worse yet, God is turning Israel, along with you, over to the Philistines. Tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. And, yes, indeed, God is giving Israel's army up to the Philistines. Saul dropped to the ground, felled like a tree, terrified by Samuel's words. There wasn't an ounce of strength left in him, he'd eaten nothing all day and all night. The woman, realizing that he was in deep shock, said to him, Listen to me. I did what you asked me to do, put my life in your hands in doing it, carried out your instructions to the letter. It's your turn to do what I tell you, let me give you some food. Eat it. It will give you strength so you can get on your way. He refused. I'm not eating anything. But when his servants joined the woman in urging him, he gave in to their pleas, picked himself up off the ground, and sat on the bed. The woman moved swiftly. She butchered a grain-fed calf she had, and took some flour, kneaded it, and baked some flat bread. Then she served it all up for Saul and his servants. After dining handsomely, they got up from the table and were on their way that same night. The Philistines mustered all their troops at Ephek. Meanwhile Israel had made camp at the spring at Jezreel. As the Philistine warlords marched forward by regiments and divisions, David and his men were bringing up the rear with Achish. The Philistine officers said, What business do these Hebrews have being here? Achish answered the officers, Don't you recognize David, ex-servant of King Saul of Israel? He's been with me a long time. I found nothing to be suspicious of, nothing to complain about, from the day he defected from Saul until now. Angry with Achish, the Philistine officer said, send this man back to where he came from. Let him stick to his normal duties. He's not going into battle with us. He'd switch sides in the middle of the fight. 
what better chance to get back in favor with his master than by stabbing us in the back? Isn't this the same David they celebrate at their parties, singing? Saul kills by the thousand. David by the ten thousand. So Achish had to send for David and tell him, As God lives, you've been a trusty ally, excellent in all the ways you have worked with me, beyond reproach in the ways you have conducted yourself. But the warlords don't see it that way. So it's best that you leave peacefully, now. It's not worth it, displeasing the Philistine warlords. But what have I done, said David. Have you had a single cause for complaint from the day I joined up with you until now? Why can't I fight against the enemies of my master the king? I agree, said Achish. You're a good man, as far as I'm concerned, God's angel. But the Philistine officers were emphatic, he's not to go with us into battle. So get an early start, you and the men who came with you. As soon as you have light enough to travel, go. David rose early, he and his men, and by daybreak they were on their way back to Philistine country. The Philistines went on to Jezreel. Three days later, David and his men arrived back in Ziklag. Amalekites had raided the Negev and Ziklag. They tore Ziklag to pieces and then burned it down. They captured all the women, young and old. They didn't kill anyone, but drove them like a herd of cattle. By the time David and his men entered the village, it had been burned to the ground, and their wives, sons, and daughters all taken prisoner. David and his men burst out in loud wails, wept and wept until they were exhausted with weeping. David's two wives, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail widow of Nabal of Carmel, had been taken prisoner along with the rest. And suddenly David was in even worse trouble. There was talk among the men, bitter over the loss of their families, of stoning him. David strengthened himself with trust in his God. He ordered Abiathar the priest, son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod so I can consult God. Abiathar brought it to David. Then David prayed to God, Shall I go after these raiders? Can I catch them? The answer came, Go after them. Yes, you'll catch them. Yes, you'll make the rescue. David went, he and the six hundred men with him. They arrived at the brook Besor, where some of them dropped out. David and four hundred men kept up the pursuit, but two hundred of them were too fatigued to cross the brook Besor, and stayed there. Some who went on came across an Egyptian in a field and took him to David. They gave him bread and he ate. And he drank some water. They gave him a piece of fig cake and a couple of raisin muffins. Life began to revive in him. He hadn't eaten or drunk a thing for three days and nights. David said to him, Who do you belong to? Where are you from? I'm an Egyptian slave of an Amalekite, he said. My master walked off and left me when I got sick, that was three days ago. We had raided the Negev of the Carathites, of Judah, and of Caleb. Ziklag we burned. David asked him, Can you take us to the raiders? Promise me by God, he said, that you won't kill me or turn me over to my old master, and I'll take you straight to the raiders. He led David to them. They were scattered all over the place, eating and drinking, gorging themselves on all the loot they had plundered from Philistia and Judah. David pounced. He fought them from before sunrise until evening of the next day. None got away except for four hundred of the younger men who escaped by riding off on camels. David rescued everything the Amalekites had taken. And he rescued his two wives. 
Nothing and no one was missing, young or old, son or daughter, plunder or whatever. David recovered the whole lot. He herded the sheep and cattle before them, and they all shouted, David's plunder. Then David came to the two hundred who had been too tired to continue with him and had dropped out at the brook Besor. They came out to welcome David and his band. As he came near he called out, Success! But all the mean-spirited men who had marched with David, the rabble element, objected, they didn't help in the rescue, they don't get any of the plunder we recovered. Each man can have his wife and children, but that's it. Take them and go. Families don't do this sort of thing. Oh no, my brothers, said David as he broke up the argument. You can't act this way with what God gave us. God kept us safe. He handed over the raiders who attacked us. Who would ever listen to this kind of talk? The share of the one who stays with the gear is the share of the one who fights, equal shares. Share and share alike. From that day on, David made that the rule in Israel, and it still is. On returning to Ziklag, David sent portions of the plunder to the elders of Judah, his neighbors, with a note saying, a gift from the plunder of God's enemies. He sent them to the elders in Bethel, Ramath Negev, Jadar, Eroer, Sifmoth, Eshtemoa, Rasel, Jeremelite cities, Kenite cities, Horma, Borashan, Athic, and Hebron, along with a number of other places David and his men went to from time to time. The Philistines made war on Israel. The men of Israel were in full retreat from the Philistines, falling left and right, wounded on Mount Gilboa. The Philistines caught up with Saul and his sons. They killed Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malkishua, Saul's sons. The battle was hot and heavy around Saul. The archers got his range and wounded him badly. Saul said to his weapon bearer, Draw your sword and put me out of my misery, lest these pagan pigs come and make a game out of killing me. But his weapon bearer wouldn't do it. He was terrified. So Saul took the sword himself and fell on it. When the weapon bearer saw that Saul was dead, he too fell on his sword and died with him. So Saul, his three sons, and his weapon bearer, the men closest to him, died together that day. When the Israelites in the valley opposite and those on the other side of the Jordan saw that their army was in full retreat and that Saul and his sons were dead, they left their cities and ran for their lives. The Philistines moved in and occupied the sites. The next day, when the Philistines came to rob the dead, they found Saul and his three sons dead on Mount Gilboa. They cut off Saul's head and stripped off his armor. Then they spread the good news all through Philistine country in the shrines of their idols and among the people. They displayed his armor in the shrine of the Ashtoreth. They nailed his corpse to the wall at Beth Shan. The people of Jabesh Gilead heard what the Philistines had done to Saul. Their valiant men sprang into action. They traveled all night, took the corpses of Saul and his three sons from the wall at Beth Shan, and carried them back to Jabesh and burned off the flesh. They then buried the bones under the tamarisk tree in Jabesh and fasted in mourning for seven days. <laughs>